Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Elfrank, head of marketing over here at Empire Flippers. And today I am talking to Roland Frazier. This is a guy that one of my friends introduced me to, actually. So I was speaking at Affiliate World Barcelona last year, and one of my contacts was like, oh, you, you should talk to Roland. He does all sorts of stuff that is very similar to Empire Flippers. You guys would get along great. So Roland and I have actually been talking about getting onto each other's podcasts for a while, and we just were like ships missing in the night. We're just between his event schedule, my event schedule, we just always seem to miss each other. But during that year, I actually like went down the rabbit hole, watched his YouTube videos, and I really like this guy. I think he has a lot of really creative deal making power and like really cool stuff that you can learn from him. And you get to hear tons of value in this podcast. There is something to note. There is an abrupt ending to this podcast, most likely. We'll try to edit it to where it's not as abrupt. But Roland, unfortunately, he had to run to a coaching call for his group. So we had to cut it a little bit short. But with that said, like even if we kept it to a normal length, like I wouldn't have gotten to all my questions because as you'll see, like Roland says a bunch of stuff I want to comment on and expand on and talk to him about. So we might do a round two. I don't know. Let me know if you want us to. You can shoot us an email or give us a comment. But with that said, enough of me talking. Let's get into Roland's episode here. It is super, super valuable. And if you like it, remember to leave a review, share the episode. It all helps us grow. So with that said, see you on the other side. All right, I have Roland Frazier with me, and this interview has literally been in the making for probably about a year. <laughs> when I first, <laughs> but I was at Affiliate World Barcelona speaking, and one of my buddies, Peter, was like, you got to talk to Roland. Like, who is Roland? And he introduced us over WhatsApp, and I fell in love with your YouTube channel. So I am a big fan now. Peter has converted me. So Roland, welcome to the podcast. Tell my audience a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of you and all the things you guys are doing too. It's really cool. My 60 second background is I basically came up in real estate and I was a real estate agent and then trying to find ways to sell houses a lot faster. Realized if I went to centers of influence, builders and developers, I could not work as hard, but get lots more listings in doing that basically got introduced to the world of raising money. I was like, how do you guys do these developments? And so I ended up getting insurance licenses and securities licenses to help them acquire properties, acquire investors and do these syndications. Did, I don't know, about 10,000 houses that we developed across the Eastern United States, all the way down to the Cayman Islands. And then as I was going to school, got a degree in accounting, practiced law, all the whole time I was really thinking about buying companies. I got my securities license when I was 20 and I got taken under the wing of an investment banker out of New York. And he kind of showed me the world of leverage buyouts. And I was like, this is cool. You can buy companies with their own money. And, <laughs> you know, I had been exposed to no money down real estate through Robert Allen, who ended up being somebody I got to know and just kind of like really loved the idea and the practice of acquiring companies and selling them. And because my first mentor in that space was an investment banker, the selling was, you know, the primary thing it was like, you know, we acquire to sell and practice law for about 13 years and just really have been focused on doing deals for, you know, about four decades now. And it's just the most fun thing in the world to do. <laughs> I love it. I, the uh, creative finance and creative deal structuring. So my background, my father is a real estate broker. And when I okay. bought my first house when I was 20, my mortgage broker said, oh, I know your dad. He's like the famous man who always finds a way to make a deal happen. And like back in nice. the 80s, he actually bought houses using opals because he had this tenant that would pay them in opals because they didn't have the money. They just had these random opals. And That's he ended up great. buying multiple houses with it, getting a truck. And eventually he always somehow got the Opals back, but then he eventually got his real estate license and the other realtors was like, whoa, <laughs> Kevin, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> Don't use the Opals. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it. for my audience that may not know what a leverage buyout is, I, like, I know what it is. I think it's a very exciting topic, which we're going to get into, but maybe you can give a 30 second overview of what is a leverage buyout. Sure. Yeah. It's super simple. It's basically just that companies very often have assets that you can borrow against. And so the leverage is the debt that you borrow against the assets that they've got. And then you use the money from the debt 
to pay them for the company. So effectively, the company pays for itself. I uh, love it. Uh, <laughs> leverage buyouts or all the rage. It was that I haven't read it in forever, but I think the Predator's Ball was all about leverage buyouts too. But yeah, like yeah, and they book. even had movies like Pretty Woman, right, and all those kinds of <laughs> yeah, things. Like, yeah, it was it was Lord everywhere. <laughs> Good time. <laughs> so you built and acquired, and now have sold dozens of business too, if I'm not mistaken. So you've seen a lot of deal flow, probably more deal flow than the majority of people I've talked to, and that includes, you know, like. The aggregators have raised literally hundreds of millions of dollars. I would say you probably have seen mm -hmm. more deal flow. So when you're looking at these businesses, how do you identify the good from the bad? Because there's a lot that goes into the filtering process. Like that's one of our unique selling propositions, right? I'm sure you see, I'm sure you have your own systems to weed through it. So what do you do? Well, I have uh, systems on Empire Flippers to weed through it, right? I've got my uh, my acquisition criteria set up and my lists of deals that come I'm and they've got different names. I'm alerting our salespeople now to look at Roland's criteria. <laughs> How can we get this done? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to me, it, it all comes down to the criteria. You've got to know what you want so that you know what you don't want. That's to me the first filter. And so I look for like to say what's a good deal. I guess it just depends on you know, on what your goal is. Like if your goal is that I'm looking for a business that I can come in and run and add value to, then a good deal is a deal that's at fair market value. If you're looking for an improvement or a flip, then a good deal is a deal that's below fair market value. And if you're looking for a strategic, a big mistake that people make is saying, I'm okay paying over market value because I can add all this value to the deal that I'm looking for. I think that's a mistake because that's your money. That's not their money. And so a lot of people give that money that's theirs away. And you know that's not generally a good idea. So for me, a good deal is one that really fits into my vision of vertical that I'm into. And so if I'm going into a new vertical, it would be a good deal would be a company that's that can serve as a platform for me to add additional companies to, because I like to grow by acquisition as well as organic growth. And so in that case, I'd be looking for a company that's got, say, no fewer than 10 employees, that's been around long enough to have a strong brand, that's got some share of voice in the market, that's probably a market leader, that's not a, a me too company, meaning a company that is just competing on price basically, right? Because that's ultimately you go, it's a race to the bottom. That doesn't make any sense. So what's the unique moat that's around that company? If it's got a moat, I'm definitely interested in it. That can be intellectual property. That can be brand. That can be first mover advantage. A lot of things like that, supply chain advantages, profit margin advantages. And so it really just depends on that. I think generally I'm looking for something that I can come in and acquire at under market value. And it's a seller that's motivated, just like in real estate, you know that from your background. <laughs> sure. Somebody that's got some reason for wanting to go out and sell faster, and therefore they're willing to take a little bit less for it. And then I can come in and I've got built-in equity when I come into the deal. Now then it's gotta have those other components that I'm talking about because I'm looking to grow it and sell it. And if there's no blue sky left in it, if they've kind of like, you know, they've tapped out the market, then it's not going to be exciting for a buyer. So it's not going to be exciting for me. Is that helpful at all? There are so many tangents that I want to go down on based on what you just <laughs> said there <laughs> on all, all the stuff. So like the criteria, I think that's great. I think that's what we tell people to do is to you know, like figure out what you're trying to do. Like what's your goal here? Right. But I love the, uh, you know, am I planning on buying something I'm growing or flipping? Because like I remember early on in my career, we had people like, why would EF ever list this site as like, this bad SEO to it with a Google penalty. Like, well, some people, that's literally what they want because they know to fix that penalty. So they get to buy that right. on discount, right? Like that's the difference between vetting and due diligence. We're just making sure it's a legit business, right? So I really yeah. like you touched on that. There is something I wanted to ask you about because I, I think I like, I've known of this, I think for a while, at least I'm pretty sure this is correct. I might embarrass myself, but you became partners or some part owners of a digital marketer, right? Yeah, I still own a uh, digital marketer with Ryan Dice and Richard Lindner. Well, you can tell Ryan Dice that I learned the first bit about the marketing funnel from his courses. <laughs> I will I will let him know. He's actually not too far from you right now. He's in Europe with his kids on a vacation. So, oh, uh, very cool. I'll see him again awesome. in Mexico in about two weeks. Awesome. 
Yeah, we actually sponsored TNC. TNC is part of that package, right? Like you own part of TNC as well? Yes. And so we exited 80% of TNC. I basically came in, acquired a third of Digital Marketer. I think I'm at like 42% now. And TNC was one of the assets that Digital Marketer had. We spun it off into a separate company. And then I got the wonderful job or opportunity of growing it. And so basically upgrading the production values and building sponsorship. There were no sponsors when I came in. And we basically built that up, sold it to a Blackstone company in 2018. Fortunately, uh, 2019, we had our earn out. 2019, we had our earn out in 2020 pandemic, all events canceled, (laughs) slowed down. Yeah. So, and I still have an interest in it. Interestingly enough, we just did an equity deal with the company that Blackstone owns that bought that for managing some stuff. So it's definitely... That and several other marketing companies I still have interests in. That is awesome, man. I'm a big fan of the digital marketing, but when you were mentioning sectors, I knew you kind of played in that space because I'm a fan of all those brands. So I kind of nerd out seeing like who's behind all of this stuff, right? What you just mentioned there, I'm curious on that. So a story I've heard, especially people that do a lot of creative acquisitions, like such as yourself, they will buy a business, they will flip it like TNC to this Blackstone company, and then they somehow get a hold of it again. So maybe we can, yeah. before we like give some more general advice for the audience, maybe we can talk a bit about like, how does that happen? Like they gave you a bunch of money and now I'm assuming they're giving you more money to come back in and help them with stuff. So tell me the story. If you're, if you're- it, it happens, it happens a lot and usually happens. It didn't happen this way in that case, but the more common thing is like, I've got a buddy I helped sell his photography education business. So he had an e-learning business in the photography Mm -hmm. space. We sold it to a pretty big private equity fund as a front-end lead gen for another SaaS that they owned, which is a great play. We're actually in negotiations with two different companies I own right now for that same thing, where we have something that is a perfect front-end for a big SaaS company. And so that's a great opportunity, right? Especially stuff that you've got on EF is there's a lot of stuff like that that you could take, build up, knowing that maybe it's good for lead gen on the low end, but somebody's got a SaaS that's going to have a great valuation. They might want to have that as an acquisition that they can bolt on that then now they've got a value ladder and a lead flow that's complete. So like in the uh, photography guy, his situation, we sold it for mid eight figures and the private equity fund put in like fresh faced 22 year old MBA graduate to run the company. Masters. This is a company, you know, from the marketing space, like you got to be on top of marketing. If you've got a lead gen company or if you've got, I mean, even in e-learning, you got to be a pretty good marketing chop person to run a company like that. And so this person came in and was like, you know, they had that the academic education, but no real world experience. The SaaS people, have their own SaaS way of marketing things. You know, we do opportunities that become demos that become this. Well, so don't tell well. people what the price is. <laughs> and, uh, and basically took the business from, I think it was making a profit in the neighborhood of about 2.7 million down to, I think maybe a hundred grand. Oof. And so we were able to reacquire it for $265,000. And that happens over and over and over again, because the buyer, and this is such a great lesson for everybody that's watching or listening, right? Is that the buyer either thinks they know how to run it better and doesn't listen to the person who's selling it and really understand how did this business create itself? How did it get successful? How do customers happen? And can I, as the acquirer, continue to have customers happen in that way. If it's word of mouth or the brand of the seller, the answer is probably no, right? If it's, you're the face for the business, right? It's probably no. It's so you got to think about that. Or if it's, well, we acquire based on webinar sales, assuming that you can acquire customers for 49 cents, but ad costs have gone up. And if you look at CAC in the industry, that's gone up so high, that model doesn't work anymore. Because very often I see sellers who realize in advance, they see the changes that are happening in the model of how customers happen and they realize they can't continue to do it. So they're looking to offload to a buyer before they start having a negative trending EBITDA, right? So that to me is 
really important. I think that's really what happens more often than not, that it's either not a cultural fit. It's not a strategic fit that they thought it was going to be. They overvalued their ability to add value to the business. They lost interest in the business because they are playing a different game than we are playing as entrepreneurs. Like if you're a private equity fund, you don't make your money the same way that we make money owning the business, right? In that case, it's the business that's the product, not the thing that the business sells. And so you have to think about those things. And I think that's what creates those situations. Yeah. I felt the pain of the spreadsheet ninjas coming into our space during the rise of the FBA aggregators. There's just all these people, they were very good at the actual M&A side of things, right? But when it came to actually running an FBA business, like I have a lot of friends in the space, as you might imagine, a lot of vendors that these guys are their clients, the FBA uh, business owners are clients of theirs. And they told me almost without fail, all the aggregators, they always saw their profit like dip, like quite a bit usually, or like barely holding steady. And yeah, it's like they understood how to put together a good deal, but less so on running the actual e-commerce store. <laughs> so yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with that they are institutional marketers, not entrepreneurial scrappy marketers. And so they think differently and their risk tolerance is different too, right? So they like they're not able to innovate at the velocity that an entrepreneur can innovate because the entrepreneur is looking at everything all the time in that business and looking at their KPIs and saying, I see this happening. And oh, by the way, seems like TikTok's the place that I need to be now. So I'm going to start diverting some ad spend over there. That's not how they think, right? They're thinking, you know, we're going to make our money because we're better business people. I swear, because I did several of those negotiations, right? To aggregators. It's like, you know, you child, you don't know how to run a business. You know, we, our MBA, you know, from Harvard is going to show us how to run a business better. We're going to professionalize the business and you're missing on all these, you know, unit economics and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, yeah, but can you sell it? You know, can you sell it? What are you going to do to refresh the webinar, right? (laughs) It sounds like you and I have had a similar experience with this space a bit. Oh yeah. There was one aggregator who literally told me, we know that the seller is better served by coming to us privately versus coming through you guys because they just pay a useless tax that we have to pay for it. So what are you talking about, man? Like, I've seen the deals. Like, sometimes you guys structure earnouts where the seller will lose because you use it as a capital risk mitigation. The seller doesn't know this because they've never sold a business. They don't know how this stuff works. And like, you're yeah. just you're like exploiting them. Like, they come to us because they're like, sometimes you guys prey on them. But he's just like, yeah, I'll tell you one, (laughs) one that I just learned that was a good thing for me to know is we had a company that had, you know, you have carried interests. So basically you sell 70, 80% of your company and you hold on to your carried interest. You hold on to that 20 or 30%. And very often that can be worth more than what you sold the big chunk for as the company goes public or whatever. And because of the pandemic, We saw a lot of companies that went from profitable to either flat or negative EBITDA. And so what happened was anybody that was on with any of the sophisticated private equity firms, anybody that had the carried interest that had a put call option or a call option where they could be bought out, got bought out and the buyouts were structured as a multiple of EBITDA. EBITDA was zero. So they picked up 20, 30% of all these companies like hundreds in one case of companies just wiped out all of the carried interests for zero, right? So that that was like, ah, new negotiating thing. Don't just make it even though. That is wild. I I mean, it makes sense that that would happen, but I never thought about it in those terms. Like that was a very sad day for the entrepreneur, very great day for private equity, I guess. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Wow. All right. Well, let's give some more advice to our audience who are looking to do kind of what you're doing. So when people are, are buying businesses, what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen, whether you've done them or maybe some of your students have done? I mean, I think the biggest one we talked about a minute ago, which is that you overpay because you have to establish a way that you're going to value the business and you have to stick with it. And so the business is only worth what the business is worth. And so I believe that like I see more often than not, people that overpay for a business because of the value that they believe they're going to add to it. And I just tell them like, that's your money. That's your money. That's why you're doing this. So when the seller's like, yeah, but you can take this and do this and this and this and this. And I'm like, 
but you didn't do that. <laughs> if you want to do that and then have me buy the business for more cool. But if I'm doing that, that's mine. You don't get to keep that. Right. So I, I advise sellers never to sell on potential because one of two things happen. Like you either get massive buyer regret from the buyer because of the mistake you're mentioning here or the buyer who is more savvy is like, great, I'm going to pay you very little upfront a massive earnout because of all this potential earnout. we're going to have together, right? So yeah. <laughs> you often just set yourself up for a worse deal, whether you're the buyer or the seller when you sell on potential or buy on potential. You really do. You really do. Other ones that I see would be on smaller deals. And this is contrary to what most people recommend, I would say, is doing all of your due diligence up front and then having multiple deals that don't go through. And so you're basically eating quite a bit of attorney and accounting time. So I like structuring deals with heavy reps and warranties in the agreements. And then I can do the due diligence after the deal closes. Now, if you're putting other people's money in the deal or your money in the deal, you want to be careful to balance that. But I think there's a lot of extra due diligence that you can do after the fact. And as long as you've got the protections built into the agreement, you know, you've got some flexibility. I think not having an offset provision in the agreement for seller financing to be reduced proportionate to things that you find out is a big deal. I think not having a basket in so that you've got an amount that is there that's held back in escrow to cover discrepancies. I think that's an important one. You're, we're talking from the buy side right now or the sell yeah, side? Yeah. Uh, let's stick on reps and warranties for a second because this is, this is language yep. like even the buyers of my audience may not be totally familiar with. So describe sure. how reps and warranties are used in the acquisition. Like what are they? When should you use them? How to use them? Sure. So it's basically representations and warranties. These are the things that you are promising to be true. So as the seller or buyer, there are certain things that you want the other person on the other side to say is what's going on, that I can count on this, I can trust this. And so we put that in a section called representations and warranties. And that might be really simple things like the business exists. The business is this kind of entity. It's in good standing. It's in this location, right? But that, that, um, it's that made all of its funny, tax I have seen sellers try to pull off selling something that does not actually exist. So yeah. <laughs> Right? It's crazy. But then it would be the other things that are the assumptions that you are relying on that you're making. So like you might assume that all of the taxes have been filed or all the sales taxes or all of the VAT or whatever, depending on what you're buying. I've got a deal right now where I'm helping the seller. So I do, I consult with people to help them get good valuations on their exits, right? So I'm helping them and they've got this issue potentially with VAT, even though they weren't selling like directly in these locations, there is arguably VAT that's outstanding. You know, well, I've got to mitigate that in reps and warranties because the buyer is assuming that there isn't any potential liability there. We think there might be, but we don't know that there is. And so I've got to put a representation or warranty in that says, that there may be something that's outstanding, or I need to be sure that I'm not allowing a representation or warranty to exist that says you represent and warrant that all taxes of any kind, any place in the world have been paid because we can't do that. And so it's an interesting part of the negotiating process to say, number one, do I disclose that? Is that a material disclosure that I make? And number two, do I allow them to have this rep and warranty that is this broad, sweeping, overbroad thing that covers everything in the world, you know, and that, and, and that can very often lead to something you have to have a further negotiation about, but then it can go down to specifics. Like you warrant that this employee is going to stay. You warrant that you haven't heard of any litigation. You warrant that there's nothing that's changing in terms of the market that you haven't disclosed to us, you know, it can be, and now that would be one I wouldn't agree to, but it'd be one I might ask for, right? So, and that's the danger of using prefab template contracts is that my buyer contract is way different than my seller contract, particularly in reps and warranties, right? It's like, I don't want to warrant anything and I want you to warrant everything. Right, yeah, you know, I don't want to earn out at all. I just pay it all up front, right? right. It's a very different mindset <laughs> when you're in the selling game. Yeah. With reps and warranties, so we do almost exclusively asset sales versus say stock sales. Is there a yep. difference between these two things when you're talking about reps and warranties? 
Yeah, I'm much, much more concerned about liabilities that might exist in a stock sale than I am, including undisclosed equity. Like, remember when you started this business and you promised your, you know, Uncle Bob that you were going to let him have 17% of the business if he gave you that first 20 grand and now it's, you know, a hundred million dollar business. Well, if you didn't take care of Uncle Bob, but Uncle Bob still got a contingent claim for equity and I'm going to have to deal with it if I buy the stock in your company. Same thing for the sexual harassment suit that, you know, you didn't disclose that has been percolating for years or the <laughs> unpaid payroll taxes or, you know, the software contracts that didn't get signed. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that can come back that liabilities in that stock sale are going to exist going forward for you as the buyer. And so when I'm doing a stock sale, my reps and warranties are way, way more strict than they are in an asset sale. An asset sale, I'm primarily concerned about successor liability. So as long as I know that there's no fraudulent transaction going on, that the debts that exist have been disclosed and either paid or we're assuming them in the process or they're getting paid off in the closing, then I'm much, much less concerned about those. So for sure, the level of reps and warranties is going to be lower for me in an, in an asset, you know, an APA, an asset purchase agreement than an SPA. That makes total sense. In terms of, so like your claim to fame or well, like one of the things you talk about a lot, which I think a lot of people find interesting. Mostly my good looks. <laughs> it's yeah, all your good looks, but then there's yeah, the primary. other 5%. That's the uh, creative <laughs> financing you do. So 95% yes. good looks, 5% creative financing. Let's talk about <laughs> what strategies you're using. Cause I, I love this stuff. Like it reminds me a lot of when I was younger and my dad talking about all the wild real estate deals he did. So and your dad yeah. sounds super fun. Yeah, he's a super cool guy. Very nice guy. He <laughs> makes me look like a very mean person. So he's an extreme, extremely <laughs> nice guy. So That's what cool. what are your strategies that you use for these no money down acquisitions? Like what's your go-to? Yeah. And so I want to make a distinction before we do that between no money down and no money out of pocket. Because it's really what, it's no money down for you you know, for me as the buyer generally is what I teach. It's not that there's no money going to the seller at the closing because very often there's millions of dollars going to the seller at the closing. It's just not coming from the buyer. Thank you right? for making that distinction. Those terms are often interchangeable, but yeah, I meant no money out of pocket from the buyer. Yeah. Cause yeah. no money down deals, like no money, like the seller gets nothing at closing. Those are way, way harder and way, way rarer to get an actual good profitable business. Yeah. Something's going to come at closing. So the question is, how do I have the something that's going to come at closing, not come from me? And I think I'm at 226 strategies now, but just a couple that you know, anybody can use. One of the easiest, of course, is seller financing. You know, let's let the seller have skin in the game. I really, really like the seller to have seller financing because it tells me that they believe enough in the business and in the business with me as the owner to have some stake in the business's success. Like if the business doesn't work out, they're going to lose. Circling back to one of the mistakes that people make, I'm always buying in an SPV. So I set up an entity, a special purpose vehicle for the specific purpose of doing the acquisition, whether it's an asset sale or a stock sale, I never want to have any risk of my personal assets or credit or my other businesses assets or credit when I'm doing one of these deals. So I'm going to set up an SPV that's going to allow me to do lots of things, including seller financing that I won't be personally liable for, right? Because I'm happy to seller finance, but I'm not happy to say, let me take my house and sell it and pay you if things right. don't work out. Right. Particularly if you didn't tell me everything in the business. <laughs> so seller financing and earnouts, which we've talked about. So, you know, hey, we we have some amount of the sale price that we can't agree on. And we agree on some metric over some period of time, like from one to four years is average for an earnout. 10% to 40% is average for an earnout in terms of percentage of the purchase price will be deferred and then some metric, some KPI, it might be employee retention, client retention, earnings, profits, you know, it could be a lot of different things that are the conditions that we set. That's a really good one. Then we get into more fun stuff like maybe supplier financing. So let's go to the suppliers of the business and say, you know, hey guys, how about extending our terms from SCOD, collect on demand, right, or delivery to 90 days? If you'll give us 90 days now, well, if I've got a $100,000 inventory turn every 30 days and I get a 90 day extension, I get three months of additional pay time. That's 300K in cash that I can carve out of the business 
that it was already paying that I don't have to pay now. So if I'm going to give the seller the ability to collect $100,000 a month for three months after the sale, I can do that in the cash flows coming from the company. I can factor accounts receivable. I can look at credit card reserves to see if I can get them released. One of my favorite deals, a couple million dollars in credit card reserves that had just accumulated over about 15 years and nobody was thinking about them. (laughs) And so you acquire the business and you're like, hey, credit card company, you know, we're current with everything. Our chargeback rates are extremely low. And how about releasing that money? Okay. (laughs) Yay. Right. You know, so it's really fun inventory consignment. So a lot of people that have inventory based businesses and you're having a hard time kind of figuring out the financing and this works like to close a gap too. So a lot of creative financing can close the gap between what you're willing to come out of pocket and what the seller needs at closing. So an inventory consignment is basically, hey, look, right now we've got $400,000 worth of inventory. I'm going to let you retain the title to that. Title to the inventory is not going to pass at the closing. And we're going to leave it consigned to the business by you. And you know that the business sells $100,000 a month of inventory. So I'll pay you the cost of the inventory as part of the purchase price as we sell it so that the financing comes in for it. Now, not at the sales price of the inventory, at the cost, right? Because we need the profits to continue to have the business earn what it's going to earn. So that would be another thing. Asset-based lending. Are there assets, going back to my LBO roots, right? (laughs) Are there assets at the company that we can borrow against? Is there container financing that we can do? I mean, there's so many different things that you can look at, you know, in that regard. One of the best two that is my favorite is probably... uh, integrator financing. So basically integrator equity. So the business that you're acquiring, unless you plan on running it, you want to have an Mm -hmm. operator for it. And sometimes the owner will stay, but very often the owner is looking to leave, but there's good management in place. And they never even thought that they had the possibility of having ownership. You can go to them and let's say you have to come up with a 20% down payment and the seller's willing to sell or buy the rest, right? You can say, Hey, look, manager, you go to the manager and she's been there for, you know, 10 years and she kind of runs everything anyway. And the seller's down to like four hours a week. And you say, listen, I'd like to give you the opportunity to have part of this business. And you go to the marketing director and say, I'd like to give you an opportunity and the finance person and say that, and maybe you get 10% from her because she's the ops person and 5% from each of the other two people. Now you've got 20% and they've got home equity loans, they've got stock portfolios, investments, IRAs, you know, 401ks, you name it, all kinds of things that they can, friends and family, that they can go and get loans if they don't have the cash to come up with that down payment. Well, now you've sold 20% of the company to them. Maybe you even sold it at a higher multiple than you're buying it for, right? (laughs) But you've sold 20% to them. Now you've got your 20% down payment. You give that to the seller, you're zero out of pocket and the seller's funding 80% as a carryback. Or 40% is a carry back and 40 is an earnout, right? So then you get to mix and match these things like Lego blocks. And so I call it a deal stack, right? It's just how many bricks do I have to stack to get from me not paying anything to the seller getting what the seller wants to get for the business? I love this. All these different puzzle pieces are coming together. When you're doing a deal in something that's more asset lies, it says you've done acquisitions in the marketing space. I'm assuming you looked at agencies before, so we can use them as an <laughs> yeah. example. Yeah, like does this type of stuff work in more asset light businesses like an agency? Because like most agencies, not all, but most agencies, like it's just the talent is the asset that is there. Maybe they have an acquisition system, but usually not. <laughs> like, usually they're yeah. doing more marketing for their clients than for themselves. So like in something that's more asset light, how do these strategies pan out for you? They work the same. So of what we just talked about, seller financing still works, earnout still works supplier still works because a supplier could be maybe the content agency that you're paying regularly, right? And a lot of people don't think about things like that. It could uh, certainly from third-party financing, it works. Integrator equity works, right? A lot of the things that we talked about work. And I'd say that probably there's 150-ish of the 225 strategies that would work in that scenario. So it's really just being creative and saying, you know, what does the seller want? And what are all of the different ways I can look at this to maybe find something that I can release? Accounts receivable may or may not work depending on how they're doing the work, but there's, you know, all kinds of opportunities that people just don't think about because they're not, you know, the credit card reserves would work. A credit card reserve release would work. That's something I never 
thought about. I like I didn't know that was a, a possibility. All, all, the, all the revenue companies- based financing is one we didn't discuss. That would work there too. So basically, if you've got any business that has consistent revenue, you can generally go to Lighter, American Express, or companies like that that are RBF and say, "Give me a loan based on the revenue of the business," and they're comfortable doing it because there's a history of revenue. They're going to take their payment back out of the revenue as it comes in. And that's a great place to get a loan. I've heard of this with a bit of a twist, or maybe this is how you mean it as well. There was another deal maker I had on the podcast who's done a lot of different deals similar to you. And he mentioned that he'll often get the business owners to go get a loan. And then when he takes over the business, like it's like a debt facility, basically. And he'll give them that debt as like how the deal gets closed. Is that basically what you're talking about there with like the revenue loan? From no. Bank? Okay. No, this is a third party that would basically say, I'll loan based on the revenue of the business. I haven't had much success in having the seller go get a loan, but what I have had a lot of success is that a lot of these businesses, if they've been around for a little bit, have their own credit independent of the individuals that own them. Mm -hmm. And so you can then say, listen, let's do this. Either we'll close the transaction And then I'll draw down on the line of credit that you've got right now with the business for a half million dollars and give you that cash because the business will now service the debt. Or there is the credit for the business is personally guaranteed by you. And so I need you to, in the business, get that loan first. And then we can either negotiate a cap or the reduction of that, or I'll give you an indemnification in the event of, I haven't had any success. I have asked but I haven't had any success <laughs> getting the actual seller to use their money you know, in advance and then saying, I'll pay you back. Because yeah. ultimately they would rather, and it would be better for them just to do seller financing because the interest rate's going to be more favorable to like, That's why, true. why pay interest when you can have interest paid to you? Yeah, that makes sense. When you're doing these kind of uh, deal structures, is there like a, like a, an, like an alchemy, alchemical formula you're using here of the perfect mix of equity and debt like i've heard before that some people will say like you know they feel it's safe if they're only levered up to like 50 percent of the net profit where like 50 percent of the net profit is paying off the debt anything over that they're like well that's too much like do you have rules like that as well with how you're doing these deal structures so basically kind of like an ltv payment thing i don't really care and the <laughs> reason is so let me qualify that i would like to have a margin of error I'd like to have the business can go down 15 or 20% and I'm still going to be able to cover the payment. I don't think it's critical the way that I structure the deals with SPVs for that to be the case. Because if it happened, I'd be going back to the seller and saying, hey, things aren't going quite the way that they did go before in the business. And that's probably going to be a rep and warranty issue. So now I've got a right of Mm -hmm. offset. Or I'm going to be, man, who knew the pandemic was coming and we can't hold events for two more years? <laughs> Let's renegotiate this. And they're like, no freaking way you have to pay. And I'm going to be like, okay, but the SPV doesn't have any money. You can just take the business back or we can work something out. So I feel like I'm in a good position to negotiate if that's the case. And because of the SPV structure, I'm less concerned about it. I'm also, by the way, not buying any business that I don't believe I can go in pretty quick and add significant profit to a lot of the businesses that we acquire haven't had price increases. Like a lot of entrepreneurs are shy about price increases. And I know like out there in the inflationary world, you're like, none of the ones that I'm buying from, but (laughs) it's true. And like, I'll have, you know, with my consulting clients, I'll have, you know, arguments with them, you know, or spirited debates. And I'm like, you haven't raised prices in five years. The market is different. The market price of what you're selling is literally 23% higher now than it was the last time you did a price increase, you need to do a price increase, but I might lose customers or you might go out of business. You know, you're (laughs) like, is this it? This is all we can ever make. So very often we'll come into a business and we can raise the prices to market right away. And it has minimal effect on the people that we've got as clients. And we can always have special exceptions. We can like the one client that comes back and goes, there's no way I'm paying that. I mean, like, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll grand person you in at that rate for the next 12 months, but then we're going to have to get you to market. So, you know, we need to talk about how we do that. Otherwise you're not really a good client for us. Right. So, you know, that's a, another margin of safety that I feel like I've got that a lot of people don't think about. 
Yeah, the price raising thing. I feel like a broken record when it comes to pricing because I always tell entrepreneurs you are way undercharging for yourself for your services. I have a friend; he just bought a software business from us. I think it was for like seven hundred thousand somewhere around there. And the entrepreneur who owned it literally didn't raise their prices since I think like two thousand two when the business started. <laughs> right? Like, they had like no email list, nothing, all this stuff. Like, and so my buddy just like basically built an email list, raised prices, and right now. I think he's owned it now for like eight months, maybe. The business is well on track to doubling, probably tripling. Yeah. It keeps up on this growth just from these like very simple things, you know, not rocket science, but the entrepreneur who, who sold it. And I pricing, had to know, pricing, people don't yeah. think about pricing goes to the bottom line. Like yeah. there's no cost to raise a price. That's a hundred percent profit contribution. So like if you think about it, you can literally go from say a 15% margin to a 30% margin with a very small price increase because a hundred percent of that goes down to the bottom line, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask you, you've bought, what is it, like over 100 businesses or something crazy like that? How many businesses have you bought? Bought, I mean, or for my personal principal? account, yeah, definitely, over, 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 definitely over. over 100, yeah. Yeah, so that's a lot. <laughs> so uh, how do you manage all this? Like, how have you set up the structure? I want to get in negotiations as well, but first, like, how are you handling so many different brands? Are they all bolt-ons? Like, how do you handle this madness? <laughs> yeah. So the last time I looked, we had 38 verticals and I don't sit on the org chart of any company. I don't have a job title, which means I don't have a job description, which means I don't have a job. And that's important. So I want all the companies to be managed by someone who's an operator that is going to handle that so that my job is to do what I'm best at, which is figuring out what's our strategy and who's the team that's going to handle this? And then how do we go forward? And then how do we exit? As opposed to how do we find more buyers and what color should the button be on the you know, <laughs> buy box and the thing that's on the forum for the funnel? You know? <laughs> that makes sense. So you basically, I assume there is a, the businesses have to be of a certain size or at least the platform of the business. Maybe a bolt-on can be smaller, but I'm assuming the business has exactly. to be a You're exactly size right. to afford that though, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for my interest in the business to be $10 million or more within three years. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm curious on your thoughts. I'm pretty positive. I know what you're going to say, but in your opinion, do you think it's scarier and riskier to buy a smaller business or a bigger business? Like say you're a first time buyer. If you're a first time buyer, I would think that it would be scarier for the average person to buy a bigger business than a smaller business. I think that if you know how to use SPVs and seller financing and tools like that, your chances of success are probably greater with a larger business that's more established and more professionalized because it will already have some infrastructure and that most of the smaller businesses don't. So like as a platform company, as the company you're going to kind of have as your main company, I think you know that's true. And I love that you asked too, that you said, you know, well, tuck-ins and things like that. Cause a lot of people don't think it's like, well, my acquisition criteria is it always has to be $3 million or more in sales. It's like, but what if you can buy a YouTube channel that's got a million people yeah. for $1,500, you know, that's probably a good thing to buy. And if you say that you only buy $3 million businesses, you're not going to be thinking about that. So I'm really happy you mentioned that. Yeah. I, I like, so I see so many different business models. I'm a big marketing nerd and also doing the job at EF, you know, I get to see all this different stuff and I think a lot of people, they just, maybe they're not thinking about it. Cause I've had friends who've gone say from being an affiliate SEO with like a big, nice content site to now running an e-commerce store. And then they never think about buying another affiliate site that can drive traffic to their e-commerce store. But then my friends who do it, they just crush. Cause like they just, right. I have a friend, we were in a mastermind together. He had a e-commerce store in the, I think he was selling like dog supplements. I've told the story before, so my audience would be familiar with it, but they ended up buying veterinarian.org and built this whole media site to drive traffic to his dog supplement store because he couldn't build backlinks to it easily. And now that media site has spun off into doing like actual software potential for veterinarians because veterinarians are reading his stuff. So there's just like all right. this different potential you can do by mixing and matching these things, which that's something you talk about a lot too, about buying like Facebook groups and YouTube channels, which I don't hear about very often. Have you done that quite a bit? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a strategy we've used over and over and over again from podcasts to, you know, any media. It's just, I look at it as problem solving. So I can buy 
competitors, direct or indirect, if I want more customers today. But if I want more leads, I'm going to buy media, which might be Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Pinterest, any of those kinds of things, right? It could be events. If I want team and stuff, I can aqua hire by buying a company that has the team or the resources or the systems or the software that's already in place or dealerships or replacement, well, especially like dealerships, which are really hard to get sometimes. I can go in and acquire a company that's already got it. Now I got it, right? <laughs> sometimes you need a dealership from a physical company to be able to get a dealership for a big brand to sell it online. And they need to see a store. Well, then I'll go buy the store and now I can get them to get, right? It's really funny. But same thing like for, I need a higher average order value. Then I go find products and services that my customers are likely to buy, or I need more profit margin. I vertically integrate up and down the supply and distribution chain. I'll buy affiliates. I don't see people buying affiliates, especially online. If you're giving away 20 to 60 or more percent of your sale, of your gross sale to affiliates, and you've got a few big affiliates, buy them. You know, because all that margin now comes to you. Yes. I have a, I have a friend, he had another affiliate site. It was just a, a very typical Amazon associate site, but now it's worth over $17 million because he parlayed that audience into an in e-commerce. He's like, I'm only getting paid, for him it was the opposite end, right? Like I'm only getting paid like 5% on an affiliate commission. Like when if I could own the other 95%. So he just sourced exactly. the product he was selling the best of as an affiliate. He made his own. You know? <laughs> it's a brilliant stuff. I know we're soon to run out of time, but I wanted to stick on the media side of it because I find it fascinating. I understand like theoretically how it works, especially if you're buying like a blog that has like the media. But if you're buying a say a podcast that tends to be very personality driven, how do you go about doing that? Like, do you keep the host on? Do you have a transition period? Like, I'm assuming it'd be similar with something like TikTok as well, that they would often be more personality driven. So how do you get around that when you're acquiring these kind of assets? Yeah, I'm going to probably miss somebody in the change. But to me, one of the best examples would be The Tonight Show. The Tonight Show started with Johnny Carson and Johnny Carson was The Tonight Show. And then it passed, I believe, to Jay Leno. And then Jay Leno was The Tonight Show. And I think, is it Jimmy Kimmel that's on it now? And there was probably somebody in between. Or Saturday Night Live would be another good example. As you start with the not ready for primetime players. And Saturday Night Live is really Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi and Gilda Radner and all those people. But it's gone through multiple, multiple, multiple changes over the years because there is a brand and then these are the spokespeople for the brand. So I think a podcast, you might say, well, that's a little bit different. I think the talk show is kind of a better example than an ensemble cast, but they did it by having guest hosts. And so they tested different people coming in and subbing in when the main host wasn't there. And you can do the same thing. So I would say, let's acquire it. And then let's start testing guest hosts. Let's require that the seller stay on for maybe a year, right? And they get it, you know, they're going to yeah. get more for it if they're part of the transition. And then we maybe have somebody come on and guest host for a couple of weeks, right? And we test those people and see how does the audience respond to that. And we find the one that's the best fit. And then we could potentially co-host them for a while and then have the next people come on. But we had that with Perpetual Traffic, which we ultimately sold. Perpetual Traffic was a podcast that Digital Marketer started. I remember. And we had a couple of hosts that were there initially. And then we basically re replaced them with new hosts. The brand was perpetual traffic. So if it's the, you know, the Roland Frazier show, it's going to be harder to sell, I think, than <laughs> if it's business lunch with Roland Frazier, right? right. So that's kind of how we do it. And it's worked really, really well. Now you can test that. So you could also build in, you know, in the event that we identify some metrics and downloads fall by this much percentage, then the payment adjustment is going to go down or something. That would know, be in the warranties, I would assume, in that, yeah. that whole section. Yeah. That makes total sense to me. I mean, this podcast was initially hosted by our founders, and then it was hosted by people that worked for me. I was trying to get out of the content stuff as I rose up into the director of marketing position. Then I came back in because my manager left to go start our own freelance business. So this podcast itself has seen multiple hosts. So I think that makes sense. The, the late night show analogy makes a ton of sense to me. We don't have much time left, but I want to talk about negotiations because I feel like you need to be, to get creative financing done correctly, you also need to be a good negotiator. And I think you probably will agree with me. I feel like most people approach these negotiations as like a showdown between the buyer and seller, which is like the absolute wrong way to look at it. It should be a more of a collaboration. It's like, 
all my friends are entrepreneurs who understand marketing and take their marketing hat and like throw it into the trash can, like don't care about the buyer or the seller anymore. So right. talk to me about your negotiation strategy so we can help out our audience. I think that the biggest thing that I would say people do wrong with negotiating is that they think of it as a win or lose. And I think that you can also, like a buddy of mine wrote a book called Never Split the Difference, Chris Foss, Great. right? Negotiating. He's like, you know, well, for Chris, he couldn't split the difference because he was negotiating for hostages. So he couldn't say kill half the hostages, right? <laughs> All um, right, we, get, we got a word uh, out going. <laughs> this is, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> but this is a little different. So I start with that. I like to think of it as a collaboration. So it's collaborate, don't negotiate. And so what are we collaborating for? We're collaborating to get you, the seller, the best price that that we can get you, or at least as close to the price that you said that you want for it in a way that also works for me. So now we're on the same team and I don't really care about the price. The price doesn't become the thing that is going to make or break the deal. It's how do I get you what you want? Okay, well, you want a million dollars. Great. Market price for this business is 500,000. That's going to be hard for me, right? So then I'm going to say, here's some data that shows what market is. And then this is a Chris Voss technique. I do like, so how am I supposed to do that? Because <laughs> you want a million for it. And I've got 16 transactions where it was a half million. It's going to be really hard for me to do that. So, you know, help me out here. And that's usually pretty good at getting them to the right place. I would also say start with motivated seller for me. I really only want somebody that is a seller. I don't want somebody that says, and I've had people say this to me, well, I'd sell. I mean, if somebody offered me a stupid price for it, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I don't want Thanks. I think you just called me stupid or you're hoping I'm stupid. <laughs> what? So that collaboration though goes throughout the fabric of the whole negotiation down to when we get in a room together, I'm going to literally put the chairs on the same side of the table so we don't have a physical barrier between us to talk. And then I'm going to have a conversation. This is something I see people do too, is like, here's my offer. Respond. <laughs> <laughs> yes <Well>, or no. <laughs> couldn't we just like have a conversation about what you want? Where's the flexibility? You know, all that kind of stuff. What's important to you? And so I'll always ask, I want to know what does the other side want? And so I'll ask, what are you going to do with the money? And what does life look like after this? And very often that'll give me really valuable things to be able to get them that they want. So like, I want to take a trip around the world. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds super cool. What's that going to cost? It's going to be like $200,000. Great. And you want a million for the business? Yeah. But you really only need 200,000 right now. Well, I want to have 800,000 in the bank, you know? Okay. Well, what if you had 800,000 that was in the bank? It's just that the bank was a little different than the one that's probably going to go out of business. Like, you know, the couple banks that have gone recently, <laughs> you know, they're not that safe, but your business is, your business is kind of like a bank. So what if we had the business that was basically the bank that was taking care of that part. And we got you the 200K so you can do the trip. Well, now I'm down 800K of what I need out of pocket right now. And the seller gets what they want. And now I've got them focused on the thing that they want from selling the business, not selling the business. So it's like, what is the benefit that's going to come to you as a result of selling the business? You know, I'll have time to spend with my kids and blah, blah, blah. Great. Let's get you that. All we're down to now is the terms. I don't have any problem with your price. Even the million dollar person that wants a million for the 500K business, ask yourself, is there any scenario in the world in which you would pay a million for the business? And most people are like, no, it's only worth 500. I'm like, yes, <laughs> there absolutely is. And I'll tell the seller, like when the seller is ridiculous, I'll say, I can pay you a million dollars for this business, but it's the law of price and terms. So the law of price and terms says your price, my terms. I can give you a dollar a year for a million years for this business, right? <laughs> yeah. Now that's crazy. Yeah, I would never do that. Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> but what I'm telling you is that I can pay you more than it's worth as long as the terms work. Right. So let's talk about what that means. If you're flexible on the terms, then the price becomes less of an issue for me. But if you're fixed on, I've got to have a million dollars and I've got to have a million dollars cash, then I'm not a buyer. Are you a seller? Helps a lot. I mean, literally asking them that. And it's really important to be able to do that. And I've got people like, wow, I could never do that. I'm like, why? Well, because then maybe they won't sell. They won't sell. At the, you're not going to buy it for a million dollars cash because it's only worth a half million dollars. And by the way, you don't have a million dollars cash. So why do you care? Right? <laughs> and then the other thing is the long pause. The long pause to me is one of the most powerful tools, way more powerful than anything you can say is what you don't say. So if I'm like, 
So Greg, basically the way I see it is I can get your price. You want a million dollars. I really just think the business is worth a half a million, but it's making 200,000 a year. I can give you 50,000 a year for 20 years. So I'll get you your price and you'll have the annuity it might be even tax advantaged for you. You've sold me, Roland. I don't need no moment of pause. <laughs> but then I don't say anything. I mean, and if you don't say anything for say 30 seconds, it gets really, really awkward. Even when they've pitched you on something, they'll negotiate against themselves. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm going to need a million for this. And you're like, I mean, I could probably take 800,000. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's really a fun thing to do to do that. I am a fan of Chris Voss and all that stuff. I think the silence is golden in like everything. I've done that. And even like the reverse of so, like the idea of being like just asking if you're a seller. I remember when I used to sell furniture, there was this guy, this has happened. These people come like, oh, I could buy this chair on the internet for way cheaper. Like, great. Why don't you buy it from there? Like, do it. Like, a, like I'm not trying to be mean. Like it just sounds like a good deal. Like yeah. you'd save money. Why are you shopping here? And then that would usually end up them buying, right? And similar to a seller, like just asking them, you know, are you willing to do this? There is a quick story you reminded me of. It was actually on the buy side. A buyer got a better deal on a business because he told the seller what they wanted. We train sellers to also like problem solve for the buyer, just like the buyer should be problem solving for the seller, right? Hundred percent. The buyer got a great deal because the seller found out that the buyer wasn't just buying the business to you know make more money, which was like the surface level thing. That's what we all want, right? But they went deeper and found out that the guy actually had a a kid with special needs, and he never got to see the kid because he was on his like three hour commute to his job. Like by the time he like went there and came back, right? So he never got to see his kid, and the school was in the opposite direction. So you ended up buying this business, got a great deal and ended up growing significantly. And the seller was bought in too, which I think like buyers and sellers, this is why I say negotiation shouldn't be a showdown. Cause like you're going to be business partners with this guy for at least a little bit. You, know? like, you yeah. still like each other. Which goes back. Collaborate. Yeah, exactly. Just collaborate. <laughs> but now yeah. there's like five minutes. And I, I apologize. Sure. I'm, I'm late for a group coaching thing. I would love, love, love to talk more on the podcast and just generally, but yeah, I, have to, yeah. I have to hop off. No worries. Let's schedule a round two, maybe if you want to come back on the podcast and send me the I link. I would love to, your... to. I'd love to get you on business lunch also. Oh yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll do a part two there. And we just like <laughs> go for there. <laughs> I like it. All right, I like it. Absolute pleasure. Likewise. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace, or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business. Then you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review, give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.